Thank you, thank you. Uh, before I start, a uh, quick question. I would like to ask a question. How many people are originally from North Carolina? I love it. <laughs> Anytime I ask a question in Raleigh, like switch your hands up. Uh, and it's really depressing. I'm originally from Salisbury, North Carolina, so this work is very personal to me. Uh, all the work we do is very personal to me as we talk about moving North Carolina forward. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm from the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University. Um, and to give you a little bit about who we are and what we do, uh, we are a think and do tank. How's that? Well, first of all, I'm going to these couple slides I'm going to show you. This is me this morning. I had stitches put in my foot, so I'm popping around a bit. This is why I have three stitches put in my foot. All right. So we are a think and do tank housed in Raleigh, North Carolina at NC State University. Uh, we were created in 2002. Um, and before that, we existed as a, just as our form, our emerging issues form. How many people have been to the emerging issues form in Raleigh? Good. I hope to see you there this year as well in February of 18. Um, so before 2002, that's essentially what we were, we were the emerging issues form, which is the largest public policy conference in the state of North Carolina every year. And so we address some issue of importance to North Carolina's economy every year. And so this year, our topic, of course, is the economics of early child investment, which we're calling Kidonomics. Um, other than doing our forum, we also get out in the community, and this is what we primarily do. Instead of writing a bunch of papers or doing a bunch of data analysis, although we do do some of that, you will see some of that here in a little bit, we get out and talk to the real experts in North Carolina. You are the real experts. You're actually doing the work. And we try to figure out by engaging with you, what do we need to do to make North Carolina stronger and better? And so we're going to have that conversation at the end of my presentation, and we're going to hopefully come to some great consensus. So as I mentioned, we are housed at NC State in the Hunt Library. I mean in the Hunt Library. Okay, so those of you who have not been, you need to go. It is one of the most amazing libraries in the world. I don't say that just because I went to NC State and I worked there. It literally has won awards, international awards, for being one of the best libraries in the world. Um, it is essentially the, uh, the culmination of innovation, technology, and uh, entrepreneurship in one single place. If you've been to a traditional library, as I'm sure you have, you've got stacks of books on bookshelves. They don't do that at the library. They have a robot retrieval system that actually sits underground. And when you order a book, the robot retrieves the book from a bin and brings it up to the desk on the second floor of the library. The Naval ROTC essentially has like a hologram room where they practice landing aircraft. Like they're in, they're in Dubai or wherever they are, they can pretend like they're anywhere and practice landing aircraft as if they're anywhere in any port in the world. Students can engage with data in real time on touch screens. Professors can envision the cosmos on a touch screen and manipulate the data manually in real time. This is our space, the emerging common space, where we can, on that wall in the middle there, that blue screen, where you can pull up data on North Carolina, any county in North Carolina, and see what's going on with respect to education, health, the environment, and the economy. It is designed as a library that is innovative in every way possible, down to the chairs. The chairs were designed by designers to inspire thinking and innovation. So why did I spend that much time in the library? Because I want you guys, at the end of this presentation, to be inspired. To actually step outside your comfort zones and think about how we can do things differently. Because doing things the way we've been doing them for decades and decades and decades is not going to get us where we want to go. As a nation, we're being faced with a lot of challenges. And educating our children and at tomorrow's workforce is one of our greatest challenges. And unfortunately, we're sitting by the wayside, hoping things get better, and doing the same thing over and over and over again, which is the definition of what? Insanity. And so I hope you guys are inspired to do exactly what they're doing in the library every day, which is to be innovative, creative, and do some things that are outside the box. Now, this is the last slide of the library. This is a monorail system that will be the next iteration of the library that's going to connect the two campuses of NC State, Central Campus and Centennial Campus. So as I mentioned, it is the pinnacle of innovation. So hope you guys are inspired. So in your packets, you have on your tables, there's a little black folder like this. And in this black folder, you have two items. One is an agenda. And that agenda provides you essentially an outline of what I'm going to talk to you about here today. And on the, on the right-hand side is actually a toolkit. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that toolkit as I move along with the presentation. It's really a toolkit for communities that are thinking about 
launch an early child initiative. So you don't have to spend time on that now. I will go over that in some detail before the end of the presentation. So on that first, one of the first bullets on the outline is this topic here. So why are we talking about this? And why is it such an important topic for us to be addressing at the state right now? Because we're facing some dire challenges. Any of you who've been to our Future Work Conference in 2016, you know that the nature of the economy, the nature of work is changing. Some very smart people in Great Britain, at the United, in the United Kingdom at Oxford University, went and looked at every job at the Bureau of Labor Statistics Catalogs and said, let's assign to those jobs a number, a metric, based on how routine those jobs are. So basically, if a job is taking a screw, putting it in a hole, and turning that screw, that's the definition of a routine job. Something that is repetitive can be done over and over again the exact same way every time. So look at the job, all jobs and said, how routine are those jobs? And let's assign a metric to it from 0 to 100. 100 being 100% routine, and 0 being not routine at all. And so they basically did that. And basically, we did was took that same model and said, well, let's look at the jobs in North Carolina and see how routine they are. The more routine the jobs, the more likely they are to disappear. That was the whole lot behind doing this model because they're basically looking at how our, how our economy is automated, how machine learning is really, really advancing, and how we are seeing such great acceleration in robotics, and they're predicting that jobs are going to disappear in the coming decades. So we applied that metric, and we looked at jobs in North Carolina. And based on that metric, we are at risk of losing 1.1 million jobs in the coming decades. Now, add that to the number of jobs we're at risk of losing due to offshore, which is fueled by technology. You can't ship jobs somewhere if you don't have the communication infrastructure and shipping logistics and so forth that allows you to ship those goods and services and ship them back to the United States. Add to that, we're talking about 1.3 million or a total of 2.4 jobs, million jobs you could possibly lose in the coming decade. Now, think about that in the context of how many jobs we lost during the recession. We only lost 504,000 jobs during the recession. That kind of shows you the scope of what we're talking about here. Now, the Department of Commerce catalogs how our jobs are growing, what jobs are growing in North Carolina. So basically, look at the fast growing occupation between 2010 and 2020. This is a projection they did. And if you look at those occupations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of those occupations are jobs that are predicted to disappear in the coming decade. So the takeaway is we're growing an economy that is not suited for the future. Many of the jobs that are growing are jobs that are going to be disappearing in the coming decade. Think about that for a moment. One day you're going to be driving down the road, you're going to look across, and you're going to see a FedEx truck, and nobody's going to be driving. <laughs> Think about restaurants. How many people been to Walmart lately, or Target, and you've done self-checkout? Think about how that technology is going to accelerate. You're going to have a point at some day, someday you're going to reach a point where there aren't going to be any checkout clerks. Everyone's going to check out their own groceries. Think about all the jobs that are going to disappear because those jobs won't be needed. Restaurants are the same. You've been to Applebee's in some cities, they have cut screens where you order your apps and your drinks. Less work for a server. Someday you will not need a server at some point. And this isn't stuff that's far reaching in terms of technology. This technology already exists. This is a question of how fast we adopt the technology. When we started this in 2016, we were talking about the possibility of driverless cars. That was 2016. In 2017, in April, self-driving car testing on Triangle Expressways, right in Raleigh, already approved within one year. We were talking about it, it's already reality. In 2016, we were talking about the idea of robots delivering your food. In California, New York, Great Britain, and other cities, they have robots that are delivering sandwiches, burritos, pizzas, and so forth. You have companies that are putting these robots on the street, and any restaurant can call up this company and say, hey, I need you to deliver some pizzas today at noon. And they send the robot to the restaurant. The restaurant person puts the food in the machine, and it comes directly to your door. We're talking about this in 2016, and it's already a reality. We were talking about technology that allows doctors to do electrocardiograms in 2016. The FDA has approved that in 2017, within one year. 
Now, all these slides are designed to show you that it's not a question of if, it's really a question of when it's going to happen, and we need to wake up because it's going to impact our economy, our communities, and our lives in ways that we cannot even imagine. Now, to, to belabor this for a second, um, how many people have had an ECG in here? Where you get your heart, you put on your knees on your heart and your chest, and they tell you how your heart's doing, if you have an arrhythmia, what have happened? Now, I'm going to guess that 9 out of 10, the doctor sent you to go get that done. He ordered it for you. You went to another facility like the next week to get it done. And then sent you another appointment up with the doctor to come back and have those results read. Now, think about all those jobs, all those people, and so forth, all those machines, all that technology. He can attach some leads to an iPhone, put those leads on your chest, and get instant ECG. Think about all the jobs that are going to be disrupted once this technology is moved full scale in the medical industry. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a question of if, not a question of end. when. And this is going to impact us in ways we cannot even imagine. And the evil overlord, of course, are robots, right? <laughs> robots can do things that they could not do 10, 15, 20 years ago. Robots can do things they couldn't do one year ago. Robots can do things like navigate terrain that is changing in real time. They are just that advanced. Machines are just that fast now. When you change the terrain, the robot can adjust mid-step and not miss the beat. So, now you hear people say, baloney. It's not happening. Don't worry about it. Like the Economic Policy Institute saying, there is no evidence automation leads to joblessness or inequality. And what they're doing is they're using the old rules of the economy and saying, based on historical models, this is how things are going to proceed in the future. Here's the thing, we are in a new era, and all of our smartest people are telling us that we are in a new era and things are going to train, change drastically. You're talking about Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, we're talking about Bill Gates, we're talking about Stephen Hawking, all of our smartest people saying, wake up, it's happening. You may have people like Jeff Immel saying, robots taking jobs in five years is BS. <coughs> Well, Jeff, maybe not in five years, but Google has basically said it is their mission that if they don't have robots replacing most of what we call labor in 30, 40, or 50 years, they will have failed. Think about that for a second. We're talking about our best and brightest, our biggest company, they're talking about replacing the American workforce. All right, so what does that have to do with kids? What does that have to do with economic development? A whole lot. So, Evidence is already pointing to the beginnings of automation impacting North Carolina's economy. Once again, it's happening. So we asked Dr. Mike Wall, the NC State University economist, to tell us what jobs actually started, what kind of kinds of jobs did we actually lose between 2010 and 2015. So at the end of the recession, once the economy started growing, what are the jobs we actually saw disappearing? And these are the top 10 job loss leaders. Everything from home health aids, social service assistance, and as you can see, we lost a lot of teachers. We know what happened with that. But the jobs with check marks, manufacturing sales workers, retail sales supervisors, financial specialists, food prep workers, secretaries, and home health aides were all jobs that were predicted by that model we talked about earlier. That model we talked about, talked about signing a metric to every job and saying this job is likely to disappear. That model accurately predicted six of the top 10 job loss occupations. So this is real. These are jobs we're already losing. And talked about Dr. Mike Wall, and he'll tell you that some of that's a function of technology and automation, especially after the recession. Companies invested more in automation, more in machines, and less in people. And they continue that trend. So it's happening. Now, I will not be here to sit up here and tell you that technology doesn't create opportunities because it does. But the reality is that, take, that the jobs that technology creates are jobs that require higher education, <coughs> higher skills, more machine to human interface. And the reality is those jobs may not be where we want them to be. Years ago, if you wanted to plan a trip with your family, where did you go? To a travel agent. You'd be hard pressed to find a travel agent in any city in America. Those are jobs that are on every street corner in every city in America. Now that's handled by what? Expedia, Travelocity, Orbitz, Hotels.com, you name it. Now those are jobs that technology created, and it may be more jobs than existed before with 
um, traveling. But where are those jobs located? Expedia does not have a server farm in Raleigh or Rocky Mount or Onslow County or anywhere else. Those are jobs in the Silicon Valley, Boston, LA, and other places. So technology does create jobs, but not necessarily where we want it to create jobs. And that's the paradox. Now, we look at the jobs that are actually growing in North Carolina. Management science occupation, biomedical engineers, artists, physicists, and so forth. All of those are jobs that require higher order thinking. That a machine can't do those jobs. It requires a human touch. It requires advanced education. So that's what the economy is moving in this direction. That's what it's going to require and demand us to do different things as it relates to our education and workforce development. Now here's the big takeaway. 65% of jobs in three years, 2020, 65% of all jobs will require post-secondary credential. There's not a community in North Carolina that has 65% of the workforce in possession of post-secondary credential. If you talk to anybody who works in industry, especially hands-on jobs, they will tell you there's a skills gap. You go to places like Western North Carolina, they have job holes where employers are begging for people to come and take those jobs, but they just, just, just do not have the talent in place. Same thing in states for North Carolina. If you clean places across North Carolina, you're talking about skills gap from the existing workforce does not have the skills, or the existing workforce can't pass a drug test, or the existing workforce just doesn't want those jobs. Now think about that as we move forward in the, in the economy, how is it going to impact industry? and whether they want to stay or come on. And I don't care what metric you look at as it relates to workforce, as it relates to economic development, North Carolina and the United States is falling farther and farther behind other nations. Here's the big kick right here. In 2014, the United Kingdom and Great Britain, they mandated that every child who enters the school system learns how to code computers. Not in seventh grade, not in eighth grade, not in eleventh grade, when they first enter the school system at five years old. How many of us can say that our kids learn how to code at five years old? Or your grandkids, or your nieces, or your nephews. Usually I have like one hand go up saying their kids know how to code. Now that was 2014. That's three years old. My dad is three years old. Add 12 years to 2014. You're talking about 2026, which isn't that far off. Companies are starting to make projections already about where they're going to locate their next plant, their next facility. They're going to take a harder look at Great Britain because they have that talent, that workforce that's been learning how to code for 12 years. And our kids will just be getting to be exposed to it, maybe if they're lucky, in high school. In 2022, North Carolina graduated its first high school class that has more minorities than white students. That's if you add up all high school graduates in North Carolina, kids who are currently in, what is that, five years from now? So they go back eighth grade. So my creators were seventh grade. So they're eighth grade right now. So when that class graduates, there will be more minority kids graduating than white students. And why is that important? Because we have historical deficits in educational attainment amongst minority students, particularly Latino and African American and Native American students. Now, we're saying we have more black and brown students in North Carolina, more black and brown people in the workforce, but that black and brown workforce has less skills and educational attainment than our existing workforce. What does that mean for industry? You have to make some hard decisions if you're an industry executive about whether you stay in North Carolina. Now, this is where the rubber gets the road in relates to early childhood. Now, I just talked to you about racial, racial categories and how we have educational deficits, and this is true. But it's not just about race. Don't make that mistake it's about race. This chart shows you the percent of first graders that are proficient in reading across North Carolina. Whether you're talking about Eastern North Carolina or whether you're talking about Western North Carolina, you have communities that have huge educational deficits as represented by the number of first graders that are proficient in reading. You have communities in Western North Carolina, where you're talking about communities that are 90 plus percent white, that have only a 20 some odd percent level of, in terms of the number of kids who are proficient in reading, only 20 some odd percent. Same thing in Eastern North Carolina. So it's not just a question of race, it's a question of class and community characteristics. 
And we have our work cut out for us across state of North Carolina. So this is designed to connect this and let you know that it starts early. It starts with kids at the early ages. It's not just a question of high school. It's not just a question of community college and four university. It starts early. So this graph is designed to show you just that, how it starts early. Now we started off with a whole lot of potential. So this is a story. They drop the baby in the house. And the designer represents all the kids that are born in North Carolina. And you can see this whole water, right? And all this water is the talent pool that we have. And it's full at this point. But as we work our way down this pipe, it gets less and less and less. Because we lose talent, we lose talent over time. So let's start here. Only 50% of first graders proficient in reading. Only 38% of fourth graders proficient in reading. Only 30% of eighth graders proficient in reading. By the time you get to 11th grade, only 15.4% of kids in North Carolina meet all four benchmarks for college and career readiness, as mentioned by the ACT. As you can see, it gets less and less and less. We're losing talent all around. And once you get to the four-year universities, those people in possession of a post-secondary credential, only 37% of people have a post-secondary credential. That's not a function of what we're producing. The way we get to 37% is we're importing a lot of talent, especially our urban communities. If it wasn't for that importation of talent, this number would be drastically lower for North Carolina. Now, what's happening to kids over time is that they're leaking out. And some kids never get back up in this conduit, and they end up down here. And they never end up on track, and they end up in low-wage jobs. I was just going to ask you, are there any stats on the numbers of kids that are Actually, nobody's keeping that tax bill. So just, we don't have, we, that's a whole black box in terms of what we know with the government. So, what I did was, so that was just for the state of North Carolina. At the issue, we created one of these for every county. So, if you go to our website, emergingissues.org slash crypto career, you can click on your county and you can see this graphic for your county. So, this is the graphic for Nash County. And you can see it pretty much follows the same pattern 44% of first graders, 30% of fourth graders, 25% of eighth graders. 7% when we get to 11th grade in terms of proficiency and meeting the benchmarks for college and career readiness. 28% in possession of post secondary credit. Martin County, you know anything Martin County? Yes, I'll have that in a second. Martin County, 41, 31, 34, and 5. Pitt County, 65, 39, 36, and 9. Halifax, 29, 33, 25, and 7. The pattern, it may go up a little bit, maybe slightly different for each county, but for the most part, the pattern is pretty much the same. We're losing talent all the way across. So if you're interested in that, it's on our website. So, what we know is it starts early. That's what that last slide was designed to show you. So, we decided to take this issue on. There are other people who are working in this space and we work with them diligently, but we decided that we need to jump into this fight and help people understand this issue from a different perspective. And so this past February, some of you may have attended our Emerging Issues Forum. We had about 450 people in attendance at the Hunt Library. And we brought in people like Dr. Nathan Fox to talk to us about brain science and how it starts early. That if kids aren't on track in terms of their developmental disability, I mean developmental development, mental development rather, they may be lost and they may not ever get back on track. By the time they're age five, everything is pretty much crystallized up here. And so we're missing that first four or five years in terms of their brain development who aren't doing anything productive with those children. We brought in Dr. Robert Greenwald from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis to talk to us about what is the impact on communities. He and Dr. Art Rolnick did some of the earliest and most influential research in the 1990s on the impact of investing in early childhood and how that impacts communities. And the evidence is clear. Investing in kids pays off big dividends for communities. We'll talk about that in a second. We brought in Kate McEnroe, a site selection consultant. She works with industries when they're thinking about where they're going to locate their next facility. And what she tell, told us is that industries are starting to look at communities and ask questions about the early child system for two reasons. One, they want to know will their employees have access to those services. Two, they want to know what's their future workforce going to look like. 
You have communities in North Carolina right now, like Moore County, that is facing a deficit because they don't have any slots for early childhood. I'm not talking about four years, I'm talking about just daycare. And so employers are like, what am I going to do if I want my, my workers to have that service? So unless you're working for the hospital in Lamar County, which has their own in-house services, you don't have that service. So they're facing a crisis right now. And it's not just their issue, that's something that's been replicated across the state of North Carolina. And industry is hard to ask those questions. So, what does that mean? How do we stack up the other nations? Is this just a North Carolina problem? No. Now, we're trying to connect this in terms of looking at it from early childhood all the way up to 12th grade and beyond. And so the U.S. News and World Report collects data and they rank the best states for that system from pre-K up to 12th grade. What do the states have the best overall systems? What do you see here? Maybe hard to read. But I'll tell you what you don't see. You don't see North Carolina in the top 10. You don't see any some mistakes, that's, that's true. So where are we? Here we are, we're 34. Now let's break that down. It's an index, so it measures six different things. College readiness, we break 45th in college readiness, which is pretty clear based on the other data we looked at earlier. We were at 26 in a high school graduation rate. 30th, math school. 39th in our reading score. Now here's the long good thing. We rank number one along with a lot of other states in our pre-K quality. But you give it with one hand, we do the other, take it away. We are 41st in preschool enrollment. So we may have some of the best quality. We don't have nearly enough kids accessing that quality so they can then be productive students and productive workers later on. So, we jump into this break because we want to establish for the childhood as a human capital imperative. And it's all about our future workers. We want to make the connection to jobs and industry recruitment. And we want to talk about the local fiscal impact of investing in kids. Now, it's a great message to talk about investing in kids and doing what's right for children and families. And you will not get arguments with me. You've been saying that for years. I've been saying it for years. I worked with kids, uh, adolescents, and group homes for years. It's one of my first jobs. But guess what? That argument hasn't been gotten anywhere. And there's some people that just don't want to hear the argument. It goes in one ear and out the other. But some of those same people are receptive to an argument about what's good for the economy, about human capital investment, about what's good for industry. And so we're helping to make that message. We're helping to make that message along with all of you who have been making the other argument, along with people from like the pathway to third grade reading who have their own message. And so the whole idea is to have a lot of different messages and a lot of different ways to get everybody to the same point at the same time, which is ready and willing to do something about investing in our food. All right, so these are some of the things we're doing. Workshops, this is one of the workshops we're doing. There are five others. Now, one of the things we did, as I talked about earlier, is talking about the local fiscal impact. What is the return on investment to your community? Now, we looked at some studies to talk about how does it compare investing in early childhood to other things you can invest in as relates to economic development. So college and university investment gets you $6.80. So for every dollar, so if you put a million dollars in a community college, you're going to get a return of $6.8 million in terms of impact to your community. That's the big return. Job grants, like the JD program. $6.20 for every dollar. So one million gets you 6.4 million. Industry tax credits. So every community does industry tax credits. You don't have to pay property taxes or whatever have you if you build a red building and bring jobs to a given community. So that gets you about $2.30 for every dollar you invest. <coughs> Infrastructure, $1.44 for every dollar. Now let's go back up here to early childhood. Depending upon what you invest in, in early childhood, you can get anywhere from a $4 return on your $1 investment up to $16. So it runs the gamut. It all depends on the quality, the scale, the type of intervention, and so forth. But anywhere from a $4 to a $16 return on your investment, and we just kind of put three cents together, say maybe $10, 30 cents, depending upon what you do and how you do it, which dwarfs any of this in terms of investment. So anybody heard of the Rest Family Partnerships Program? So the Nurse Family Partnerships Program is essentially a program that works with, that, part, that pairs a nurse with a new mom. 
right? Actually, before she gives birth to that new child, and provides her with the services, wraparound services, and support for her and that new child, and they follow their parent and that child for two years. They've analyzed their program, and they know that it returns about four dollars in change for every dollar you invest. So basically, it's a back down on low projections and says that we made a six two six hundred twenty two million dollar investment every year in nursing and parks. <laughs> We get a $13.4 billion return in North Carolina. Early child education. So our $146 million that we annually invest, which is about what we invest in pre-K every year, gets us about $5.4 billion in return. Now imagine if we magnify that and serve every child in North Carolina, what that return would be. Now this is charted out over about 25 years in terms of what that return would be to communities because you have to make it let those kids grow up so you can see the benefit of that investment. Now it's not just about investing in kids, it's I mean, not just about what kids do and how they do it. Some of this is property taxes, right? We know that the good schools, the good elementary school, the neighborhoods that feed the elementary school where everybody wants to live. You're going to buy that house in that one neighborhood that's zoned for that one school over there so your kids can get all the good teaching and all the good services, right? And houses in that neighborhood are more expensive than houses across the street in some cases. Right? So we can quantify that. And we can potentially see a $387 million increase in the value of all of our homes by ramping up our early childhood services. Because we know there's a correlation in terms of the amount, the percentage increase, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to 10 percent increase in the value of your homes depending upon the value of the school system, how people place that value and then make decisions about where they buy and how much they spend for a house. So where do we come up with this? So, in every Abyssinarian project in Chapel Hill, or the Chicago Preschool Project, or you can go on and on, the Nurse Family Partnership Program. So basically, these are programs that have been around for decades. And they took those kids and they followed those kids. They said, how are those kids doing at three years old, five years old, 15, 20, 25? In some cases, these kids are 30 and 40 years old. We're talking about the Abyssinarian Project, those kids have grown. They're over here at this point. And they basically said, how do those kids pan out? What kind of jobs do they have? Are they on Medicaid? Are they incarcerated? What does their health look like? All of that has a dollar value. And basically we've been able to determine that it's kids who are who we invest in, kids who we invest in early, they're less likely to be arrested, they're more likely to be employed. They were less likely to receive remedial education, special education, when they're in elementary school and beyond. They have increased workforce skills, and they're higher earn wage earners compared to kids who didn't receive services. And you can quantify all of that. We're talking about decreased prison costs, increased home ownership, decreased school expenditures, increased employer profits, and higher local spending in your tax base. The people who are earning more spend more in your community. And you quantify all that. So when we talk about the ROI, the return on investment of your communities, this is where it comes from. Now, I'd be lying if I said told you that, that those millions and millions of dollars is money that's going to come right back to your community. That's not true. That money is going to go, some of that money is going to go to the state of North Carolina, some of it is going to go to the feds. For example, Medicaid. So we know the kids who are invested, we invest in are, are healthier less cardiovascular disease and so forth as they become adults. Well, if they aren't using Medicaid, for example, that's not a local community cost. It used to be. But now that's a state and federal cost shared between the two. So if kids are healthier, that means they're on a Medicaid. That means savings to the state of Oklahoma, savings to the feds, but not necessarily savings to the county. But it may be, depending upon how you invest in the programs you have in public health and so forth. Right? So we're talking about more wage earners and spending in your community on things like you know, goods and services, whatever they may be, that's something that comes back to your community. So it's a mix, and I can't tell you exactly where it is, but I can give you some estimates of what the amounts are. For example, in Nash, Michigan County, we look at pre-K investment. We were talking about the return being, we chalked that out for say, 20, 25 years or so, $601 million return on your investment. And that's just basically the money that we're investing right now in the kids who are enrolled in pre-K. That's not estimating any additional kids, any additional money, just the money we're investing now. This is the return we're talking about. Nurse Family Partnerships. So if we invested, what is your angle? So Four thousand and some odd dollars a year for a mom and a child to be enrolled in Nurse Family Partnerships, about the average. 
If we did that for every child in National Education County, that is, for every family that is Medicaid eligible. So basically, we looked at all the Medicaid eligible children that were born in National Education County in 2015, and applied that metric in terms of the 4 to 1 ratio, and then accounted for inflation and all that, blah, blah, blah. We're talking about $1.5 billion return on that investment to National Education County. For Martin County, $115 million return on pre K. Four hundred and thirty five million nurse family partnership potential investment. Halifax, three hundred and forty two million dollars in pre K, hundred three in nurse family partnership. Pitt County, one point five actually the numbers are reversed. That's actually should be the nurse family partnership number and the pre K number. This is what you're right here for working on my total up in here. Uh, <laughs> 1.4 million for nurse family partnership and one hundred and four. <coughs> for pre-K. And why those numbers are so different is because this model assumes that we're enrolling every Medicaid eligible family for that service. Whereas pre-K, we're just looking at the number of kids who are currently enrolled. We know that all kids who are eligible for a service in a given county aren't being served. That's why the numbers are different in the are. But it's not just money that returns to communities, it's money that comes to industry as well. Annually, North Carolina loses about $1 billion and lost productivity because moms don't have access to early care or kids getting sick. About one billion dollars and the annual That's not to mention the amount of money that wait that wage earners that moms lose they can't pay their bills. One billion dollars. And you talk about health care, all the health care that we all pay for, it's cheaper. Healthier people means less people on Medicaid, means less people going to the emergency room, which means our premiums are less. Our out of pocket costs are less. So it helps everyone all the way around. Now what I showed you was just estimates for just two programs, nurse family partnerships and pre k Now imagine you did an entire systems improvement. You improved your entire early child system across the board. You'd be able to magnify those numbers by, I don't know what the fact would be, but it would be huge. Because all of your kids would be better served, they would be more productive, and producing better in school, and better eventual employees in your system. So, where does that take us now? As we look at what's going on in terms of the systems improvement, improving the system, I just talked to you about, I just mentioned that. There are some communities that are doing just that. They are looking at their entire system and figuring out how they can revamp those systems to get better results for kids. And that's in Mecklenburg County, the East Charlotte Initiative. It's the Great Expectations Initiative in Forsyth County, in Winston Salem, North Carolina. It's the Greensboro, the Get Ready Guilford Initiative the East Durham Children's Initiative, and the Transylvania County Early Childhood Initiative. They're all investing huge money in terms of improving their entire early childhood system. Now, that's what that toolkit is designed for in that book. It's not designed to give you a snapshot of what those communities are doing. Now, this is the first iteration of that toolkit. We're going to bring out the second iteration of that, maybe in a month or so. That really, I talked to all of those individuals who work for all of those initiatives. I talked to people who donated money, so the funders, I talked to the directors, I talked to people in the community to figure out how you're doing what you did and what are your success markers. And this, this, that tool is designed to help you understand some of that and think about what you may do in your community. And so it's going to go through the second iteration, which is going to have even more detail about what those communities are doing in the coming months. So, but to give you some highlights from it, not every community is going to be ready. Some communities, maybe not something you want to buy, take a bite out of. Because you may have bruised feelings about other past initiatives. Your school system may not want to be part of it. You have that in North Carolina. Your school systems don't want to play well with others. Because sometimes they feel picked on. And we do pick on our school systems. Not because they're doing a bad job necessarily, but because that's where all the good data is. Look at the charts I showed you earlier with the pipeline. Most of that data comes from the school system. They have great data, we use it, and it makes it seem like the school system is doing a bad job. But, think about this, what we talked about earlier, they are dealing with what, they come, what comes to them. If kids don't come to them prepared and ready, and we're basically ignoring kids from zero to five, they have to deal with what they have to deal with. High schools are the same. You ask high school teachers and high school principals why you can't do better because of high school graduation rate, what they say. It's what they're bringing, it's what we get in ninth grade. Talk to the middle school. Middle school say, talk to the people in elementary school, and they go down the pipeline. We've been, been ignoring it for years, and we're still focusing all of our attention and efforts way over here, trying to do remedial education, community college, and hopefully getting them into a four-year university. 
But it may not be something you want to take on, but if it is, in many cases you will have to bring more people to the fold, inspire them, massage some hurt feelings, or whatever have you. On leadership, here's your deal with leadership. You need a champion. You're going to do something like this. If you're talking about a systems-wide initiative, you need a champion. In Transylvania County, it was County Commissioner Paige Lamel who decided we want something different. She twisted arms, she pulled gears, she got people to the table, and they're doing some amazing things in Transylvania County. For example, they have a huge problem with opioid addiction in Transylvania County. They've only had that initiative on the, on the up and running for two years. They've cut in half the number of kids that are born opioid addicted. And they did that with $200,000 investment. Now, all these other initiatives, we're talking about 10 million, we're talking about 4 million, we're talking about millions of dollars in these other communities. Transylvania County only has $200,000, and they cut the number of kids that are opioid addicted, born opioid addicted, in half within two years. That's what you can do, even if you don't have any money. In Durham County, it was Ellen Reckow, County Commissioner, and other leaders from that community decided they wanted something different. They actually put community leaders on the plane, sent them to Harlem to look at the Harlem Children's Zone, sent them to Portland to look at the initiative they have up there, and came back and decided let's do something different for Durham. They started with one neighborhood, and now they've expanded to the entire state. In Charlotte, Greensboro, and Winston-Salem, it was the funding community. We talked about the Duke Endowment, we talked about the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust, we talked about the Bryan Foundation. They came together and said, we want something different. We're tired of just rooting around in the sand, hoping for something different, and just throwing good money after bad. Let's come together, pool our money, and make something different happen. And so it takes those types of champions to get something underway in their community. Finally, I just told you about Transylvania County. Just $200,000 able to get something done. In other communities, we're talking about millions of dollars. In places like Transylvania and other, other communities, what they found is that sometimes it takes you leveraging the resources and talents of others since you don't need a lot of money. <coughs> Finding free housing, office space rather, for the people who are working on that initiative. Figuring out a way to go after the grants collaboratively versus competing for grants. In Durham, for example, in Transylvania, for example, they're saying if you want to go after the grant monies and affect these kids, let's do it. We're not going to compete with you, but Let's just figure out how you fit into this overall plan, the strategic plan we have for kids. You can figure that out, use our brand. Use us any way you can. We'll come help you deliver messages and data. Use whatever we have available. It's all about the kids. And so they're entering into collaborative funding relationships, funding relationships to get things done. Now, I cannot underscore enough the importance of data. One thing we know, for example, is there's a black hole in the top of our early childhood. Zero to five. We don't know what's going on with those kids. Most kids in North Carolina never received their own formal early childhood services. So we don't know what's going on with those kids. At best, in some cases, they're exposed to Sesame Street. At best, they're exposed to something they may get in the public library. But they come to the school system, in many cases, with huge deficits, especially when you're talking about, in many cases, our Hispanic communities. And so communities are looking at those types of deficits are trying to figure out how can we better understand what our needs are as a community. They invest the time and energy into understanding that. Charlotte, for example, took an entire year of looking at the data before they even decided what they were going to do about any of their issues or problems. An entire year. They brought in a specialist, Dr. Monroe Richardson, to help them move that process, and he's leading it in Charlotte. And what the sales I mentioned, they are, they are deploying a survey and some data collection trying to figure out what's going on with that zero to five age group so they can better understand how to target those services to those family. So we'll take some time, we'll take some effort, and doesn't mean it's just going to have to have an expert or a four-year university to do it. In Transylvania County, their data specialist is their county manager. She put together all the data reports, and she's the one leading those conversations to help them get the things they need to get done. So it doesn't necessarily take an outside expert. You can get it done if you do what you need to do in terms of partnership. Now, they want these communities just about there as a backbone organization. It's an organization that's leading this charge and making sure people do what they're supposed to do and figuring out what it is we need to be doing. And in some cases, it's a huge organization. In Durham, it's about 34 employees that are part of that backbone organization. And that's because they found out that they actually need to provide some services where there are gaps that exist. They got funding to do a lot of that, but they're actually providing some services. In Charlotte, they have maybe a five person back on organization. In Greenfield Borough, it's about two or three people. 
And Winston-Salem, we're talking about, actually they don't even have a backbone organization with Salem. They're trying to build up the backbone organization. I hope it kind of takes fruit and goes along. In Transylvania County, they don't have a backbone organization. They have such a strong group of individuals at the table pulling things together, county commissioners, county manager, smart start partnership, and so forth, that they are just getting it done by working together to collaborate. So, what's next? I've been talking for quite some time. You guys probably try to hear me talk. Now we're going to have some conversations and dialogue. Why? Two reasons. One, we have a Blue River Commission that's going to start meeting in October. Now, this Blue River Commission is being co-chaired by Mandy Cohen, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Jim Hansen, the President of PNC Bank, especially if he's uh, Eastern North Carolina. They invest heavily in early childhood, and it's one of his uh, missions in life. Senator Chad Barefoot and Brenda Howerton, President of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. Those are our co-chairs, and we have right now 18 other individuals who, that, who have signed on to be part of this Blue River Commission, and we will be releasing names of all these individuals in the coming weeks. But they are all individuals who are influential, who are invested in this topic, or individuals who definitely need to have this part of the conversation. Now what they're going to be doing is dealing with the question of finances and money. How do we pay for it, and what's going to be the impact on North Carolina's community? And we're hoping that that information will then be rolled up and packaged for our Emerging Issues Forum in 2018. So hopefully we'll have some of this out of the way in terms of the conversation about the money, at least a starting point for that conversation, and then we can talk about other things. So what we know is that when you start talking about the money and what to do with it at the same time, you don't get anywhere in that conversation. And so we're trying to separate those two conversations and bring it together at a later date so we can be a more productive conversation. The second reason I want to hear from you guys is we're doing some demonstration projects. We've been given some funding by a funder uh, that is going to give us a nice chunk of change to help us invest in communities. So basically, we're going to take a bunch of technical assistance. We're going to collect people from Frank Porter Graham from the Pathways of Third Grade, third, the Pathways of Third, path, I can't even talk, Pathways of Third Grade Level Reading, right? Those individuals, Institute for Child Success, any organization that we can think of that's willing to help and come on board, we're going to collect that technical assistance and we're going to pour it into a few select communities. Then we're going to put out the bids or applications, rather not bids, applications in the coming months. If your community wants to be a part of that, put in your application and hopefully come to the Emerging Issues Forum to learn even more about getting your application competitive. And then we're going to then decide and select those communities that we pour all that technical assistance into. The idea is to find those communities that are what we could think about our globally lost communities. Communities that aren't like way over here like Charlotte, that are so advanced and doing so many great things. And communities that are over here that are so dysfunctional or aren't doing anything or don't want to do anything. But those communities that are in the middle. Maybe they're starting, maybe they've already started something. And they need the next boost to get them where they need to be. So those are communities we're going to be looking for, those communities. So even though you, if you started something, maybe you got it down the road a bit, that's perfectly fine as well. Those are the types of communities we're ideally looking for. 